Yeah, uh, good, good, good morning. I think we have been given a very big task. Uh, but as, as he rightly put it, I think these are, we are talking about the building blocks. And what I like from this module is that we are going to, as far as we talk about human cap capital, I think it is equally important, the policy alignment. But critically important is the issue of interagency. And, and, and as he, I will be talking from my perspective of a good, exam good example and bad example. Because I have been a minister in South Sudan and in Sudan. And just to give you some of the analysis of how to compare some of these things. But I want really to, to get ourselves why these institutions are not functioning. Because I think it is an issue giving you an overview and then to see and then to get down to the year, uh, to the year, uh, to the year. Uh, because the issue of institutions becoming critical. And I think. Sometimes we take it for granted, what are these institutions? But I, and that's why I want to give you an overview first and to see whether we can make a sense of the year. Uh, I think thanks, Dean, for, for providing me a lot of this information about the institutions. This is, this is a map showing what happened over time on the quality of institutions in Africa. I don't know how many of you, you have heard about what is called CPIA, uh, uh, Country Policy and Institution Assessment. CPIA is actually a data generated by the World Bank every year by the staff of the World Bank, assessing the institution, the quality of institutions and the policies. So it's giving you, giving you a lot of sense about the quality of institutions over time. You can see from this map how many countries started in becoming resilient are few. And, and, but indeed, they, you could see some improvement. But there are some countries actually, come out, I mean, immediately also improving over time, the yellow one. So this is giving you a map about the quality of institutions in Africa. But even going further than this, these are the, the main parameters which are used in the CPIA, this, assessing the quality of institutions. They're looking usually at economic management, and then structural policies, and then policies for social inclusion, uh, uh, in, inclusive policy, I mean, inclusion and equity. And then public sector management and uh, institutions. So if you can see from the resilient countries, you could see clearly they are performing better than the rest of the countries in terms of the quality of institution. Then if you look at the far, I mean the fragile and the uh, rich uh, uh, countries, if you look at them, they are performing very badly, especially when you look at the structural policies and then the, uh, the, the economic, uh, economic uh, management, which is a, a, a typical of the, of the resource-rich countries. But if you can see, general in the fragile risk economies, they are performing extremely very bad. So this is the quality of institutions over time. But even if you look, this is giving you a map of how the trend of the quality of institution over time. And you can see the resilient uh, countries, they tend to perform better than the, uh, than the, uh, uh, the, the fragile uh, countries. Now, but even if you look at the now, the change last year, I mean 2015, you get most of the countries are below sleeping categories or even below the Southern African average of the CPIA. So this is really what is happening about the status of the institutions in Africa. This one is a book being written about the, the capacity gap. And it's a very important book that you may need to look at. I summarize this one about the performance of these countries over time. This is the state of capacity, either a strong, middle, or weak. Out of these countries, about 102 countries, in developing countries, only 8% they have performed and established strong institutions over time. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, about 44% in the middle, and then about 49% or 48% weak institutions. This over time. And you see the performance even in terms of the negative growth or positive growth. But what they have done, they have decided to see to what level some of these countries, over time, they can move to the resilient institutions. And as you can see, they say for the middle, middle, middle state with, uh, with institution, with middle uh, level quality of the institution, the time it will take, eight before eight of them, the 31, eight of them will take them almost eight of century. And four will take more than 50 years. But even for the weak, institutions, it will take them forever, these 36, 
But actually, for the 13, we take them to, to move to the high ca capacity, about three of them within less than 90 years. In Africa, out of 26 fragile countries, only 12 of them will move to a resilient capacity by 2039. So really what is happening is that we are in institutions that are producing results that are not even moving the countries to the, to the level of the stronger institution. It's a crisis, and then the question is why? But I, I want just to, to, to focus a bit on this issue of institution. What are these institutions? Sometimes we don't, usually institution either formal or informal. And they're nothing but the, the rules of the game. The way you, institutions, I think, Colonizer Rice said, is about deterring the bad behavior in us, the, the bad aspect, check on us, constrain us. But we are the one creating them. But institutions do not determine the human behavior. They themselves, they cannot be self-engineering, nor they can be self-sustaining. And that's a very fundamental when we talk about institutions. Rules of the game, they are not self-sustaining, nor even self-generating. And by themselves can achieve little by their own. So, and, and, and that's why the issue of interagency will come in here. Because we sometimes talk about institution generally, but institutions are nothing without the issue of people, interagency, and the policies. Now, there are some debate about these institutions, why are they important? Three things I want to highlight in this one. Sometimes countries are struggling to get an equilibrium, political equilibrium, that you reconcile between the political power and the, and, the, and the political institution and economic institution. If you don't get that equilibrium, you become so fragile and you become less resilient in terms of building your own institutions. I think I use the issue of Botswana as a good example, an example of, a, of, of a, a, a country that managed to use its own traditional institutions that they, 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 they got and then they managed to, to buy in and create equilibrium. That's why Botswana is now at, the, at, that, at that level of the, uh, of, the, of the progress. Now, but let me come to this interagency. I know, I think Matt said it very well. I need not to talk about you. It is a fact that when you work together, collaborate, it is better for, 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 for the performance. But sometimes it is not easy. Sometimes, nice to talk about it, but how to do it? That is the fact of the matter. And I want to get into the, to the, to the thing that when we talk about institutions, as we said, these are the rules of the game. But those who are playing the games are institutions, I mean organizations, and people. Because these are the, these are, that is the real politics when we talk about institutions, the politics of how you play the game. You can undermine the game, or you can be with the game, you can be, that is the politics, that's the political process itself within the institutions. And this dynamic within the institutions is very important to zoom in to this interaction between the institutions among themselves and institutions with the people and institutions with the organizations. Now, let, 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 me, let me summarize, and this is the example I want to provide based on my own experience. Two things inter, in the interagencies. Horizontal interagencies and vertical. And these are very important that can determine the whole of government teaming. When we talk about the vertical, uh, uh, vertical uh, interagency, we are talking about the issues of collaboration and trust. In most cases, these are the higher level. And this, the horizontal, this is now the technical level. And I want to give you two examples of my own personal experience. The vertical integration is about the whole government. All of you, you know the Council of Ministers. Usually they meet every, every week. And I have been a minister, and I saw the performance of this. And the functioning of this Council of Ministers, they meet every week, they're the one driving the whole government teaming. 
and the quality of the Council of Ministers meeting, the way they take decisions, and the way they follow the decisions, this is very important. When I went to South Sudan, and I coming from the World Bank, and I went to the Council of Ministers meeting, some of them, surprisingly, but not surprisingly, they know nothing. They will be dealing with a lot of things at the same time. Issues to do with law, mining, economics, whatever. And they assume that they know all these things. And you go to a meeting, and especially in South Sudan, rather than, the, I'm, I'm coming to this horizontal. So the minister, they assume that they know everything, they will be wasting a hell of time. Discussing issues, really, they don't have any information about it. You will be starting the meeting from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening. Discussing nothing, and you could not see the substance. And what was missing in South Sudan, it is this horizontal integration. The technical people, the civil servants. Because in one case, the civil servants are the one, the heart of the system. And they will be there. These ministers, they will be there. You know the changing of ministers over time. And there was no focus in South Sudan on this council of, I mean, on the, on the technical people, especially the under-secretaries, the secretaries and the, and the directors. So they were, they were isolated in the decision-making process. That's why the whole government teaming was so difficult. Then I moved, I went to Khartoum. I was a minister of cabinet affairs. You know, people will talk about Sudan, and this is where I saw a big difference. I was the minister of cabinet affairs, in charge of all the, of all the, uh, the ministries. There, they have a very clear plan, what they want to do. And the council of ministers, when they meet, any issue to be discussed in the council of ministers must pass through what is called horizontal integration, the, the technical committees. The relevant undersecretaries, they meet, they discuss the issue that is going to be discussed in the Council of Ministers, and they come with a one-page recommendation. And that one is, is now taken to the cluster of ministers before it goes to the Council of Ministers. And in that cluster of ministers, ministers, they, are, they will be listening only to the technical opinion of the under secretaries, and they will add it only if necessary. The relevant ministers, if they have read, they can add it something. Then they will come now to the Council of Ministers. It will take about 15 minutes to, to, to present and to discuss. So there will be not a lot of discussion about, the, about this unless you are really very good in that specific topic, then you could be coming in as a minister. 15 minutes, we are finished with that specific topic. And when I was in the, in, the, in the cabinet, I know very well, I used to know how many decisions we have taken, what is not taken, and to monitor why these things were not implemented. A clear system. And I am one of the people I was shocked, the resilient, having the civil servant in Sudan. I, I came from the South, we thought everything is being politicized and and I was shocked the quality of the, of the civil servant. And if you see Sudan, it's so resilient because of the hard, this, this, this one, horizontal level. When the civil servant, machine of government, is so, is, is so equipped, then the government can become resilient and will not be so dependent on this level of the politicians. Now, let me come to the, there's something I want to, to why, in Africa, why institutions are not functioning. In fact, what is happening in, in Africa is that we are seeing two institutions are working at the same time. The formal institutions and informal institutions. I think somebody yesterday said about the informal institutions or economies about 60%, but even importantly, in terms of institutions, this is what's happening. Informal institutions have been shown in context of Africa, they have been surviving, resilient to shock, over time. And, and for you, they will be there. If I know all of us here, if you go to Africa, you have your tribe, you have your chief, you have, unless some who are really becoming disconnected to the year. But this is our reality, and they are there, and they will continue to be there. 
So this affects these informal institutions. Then we have these formal institutions, the new ones coming. And there's, so, so there's a very the interaction between these two institutions can determine the quality of, of, the, of the institution that we are having. If the informal institutions goal are, compat are compatible with, with, with a formal institution, depending on whether these formal institutions are effective or not effective, if they are ineffective, they tend to substitute the formal institutions. And if they are effective, they complement each other. But if they are having conflicting, you could see the ineffective um, formal institutions, they become competing in the same, in the same, in the same, uh, in the, in the same institution. This is a really hard issue. South Sudan, why are we seeing a lot of nepotism, corruption? If you look at corruption, it is linked to this informal institution. When we started in South Sudan with the ministries, we came from war and we started afresh. Institutions were not effective. No institutions, actually. We discovered the ministers, they started employing almost most of their tribes. It's not unique to South Sudan because, because the institutions are so ineffective. And we discovered eventually that all oh, what is happening, yes, we are heading the, all the tribes are represented by the, the, the ministers. The ministers are actually being, being divided among ourselves. And it's not, it's not unique if you don't have any effective institutions, you are likely to have the same pattern. You get a chief of general staff is from one section, you get the rest are from and in fact, this is where you have to, the, the flourishing of nepotism and corruption, they're becoming sustaining in, in us. So th that's why when we said why institutions are not functioning, be mindful of these informal uh, institutions. Uh, thanks again for giving me this uh, data, which I found very quite important. Really, this is something we keep an eye on it. Let me give you an example. Just recently, the chief of general staff in my country, South Sudan, was released by the president. Normal practice. He was so angry, he decided to move out of the capital, Yuba, to go to his own people. And he did not even hand over. So all of his communities, he started rising up against the president because the president is from another, the Dinka, but he, the, Dinka, the Dinka are even divided into many sections. A big tension in Juba. The man was so angry. His community, the largest, actually they created instability in Juba. You could see clearly how formal institutions can easily become reflecting the informal institutions. And this is the fact in Africa that we need to be aware about. If you don't have effective institutions, you are likely to be dealing with informal institutions. Let me, let me conclude with the following. One, the whole of government teaming. It is about political leadership. A leader to become a glue for all the teams and all the governments. A leader must have a micromanagement and focus on how government function. It is within the political leadership, this is where you can have a teaming up. And a president or the political leadership must be aware about the different parts of the system. I, 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 I found from my own experience sometimes some of these leaders, they tend to assume things and they don't get into the real how the system is functioning to understand what these ministers are doing. So political leadership is a critical. But I don't want to see that it's people somewhere. It is you. Because in your capacity, you are a leader. The interagency, even in your departments, you can do a lot as a leader to become a glue for, for the people and for the department within the year, within your, 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 at your level. The, the last one which I want to conclude, the critical, the, the critical part of the national security strategy. 
why institutions are not functioning and are not effective is that we are, somebody one was saying, sometimes we are seeing ourselves that we are in institutions, but in fact, they're just like institutions. They're just like institutions. And what is happening, we are, we are working in a, in a vicious circle that we are the same in we are reforming them, and in actual fact, we are producing even more negative results. And this is what is called, we need to look, let us look to our homegrown solutions. Unpack and rethink, revisit these, these institutions. And have our own solutions that are actually homegrown and relevant to the context. And this is what is called, what is called PDIA. It is, uh, it is uh, a problem-driven uh, iterative adaptation. And the idea is that identify your problems, find the relevant solution, iteratively make consolidate these solutions, and, 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 and then adapt them to, 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 your, to, your, to your reality. Maybe national security strategy is a way of taking stock about our institutions and have a debate about this, how these institutions are functioning. And, I, and I, I have a feeling, although these institutions are functioning, I think take back seat and then look at them differently is the best way we can move to let this institution to function. Let me stop here and, uh, and thank you very much.